Welcome! This video is about nephron physiology and urine formation. It's going to be a fun one. It will probably take two videos, but we'll see. Maybe I'll get it done in 20 minutes or less. So nephron physiology and urine formation. Ready? Here we go. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about um, are, is, is Bowman's capsule. And what you're looking at here, this is a nephron. It's made up of Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. And any fluid that is able, sorry, we got a little blurry here. Any fluid that is able to make it out the bottom of the collecting ducts will um, go into what's called the renal pelvis and then it will go down a ureter and to the bladder. So anything that makes it out of this area here will end up as urine. All right, so first of all, Bowman's capsule, we'll do that with a yellow highlighter. It was named after one of the early anatomists that described the structure. And Bowman's capsule is where filtration occurs. So we can put that over here. This is the site of filtration. So it's filtering blood all the time. And brace yourself because these are some giant numbers. Look at this about 125 mils per minute is filtered by all the nephrons in your kidney every minute. And that comes to, if you look at the course of 24 hours, about 200 liters a day. Now, of course, these numbers can vary a little bit. But for, for the maximal health of your kidneys, there are a variety of ways that the kidneys can make sure that it stays at 125 mils per minute. If it drops below that too much, that's bad for our health. And if it goes too high above that, that's bad too. So we wanna hit that sweet spot of about 125 mils per minute. Of course, most of that doesn't actually end up being urinated, maybe a mil a minute if, if that. So most of this is going to end up going right back to the blood. So this is where students often like kind of blows their mind a little bit. Imagine if there's a bunch of blood right here and a lot of the water and the salts and the glucose in the blood enter these tubes. Imagine it's like a water slide and you enter the water slide and then the fluids move through. But as they're moving through, the fluids are actually able to go out of the tube and back into the blood. We call that reabsorption. So as you can see, if you only make about one mil of urine a minute, not 125, then most of it is being reabsorbed back into the blood. And that's really going to be the story. So it's a very expensive process to filter, but it's important because it makes sure that any impurities in the blood are removed from the body. Okay, so what are some of these things that are going to be able to go from the blood into Bowman's capsule and start um, going through the nephron? Well, water, but not all of it, because if you imagine that there are these capillaries here, so we'll put an afferent arterial coming in, and then what's called a glomerular capillary bed, and then an efferent arterial going out. If all of the water that was in this um, blood vessel here were able to go into the tubule, well, what would happen, right? You would end up with no water in the exiting blood vessel, and then blood blood cells couldn't move, the blood would not be blood anymore, it would just be blood cells. So that would be really dangerous and fatal. So instead, some of the water comes out, depending on how high the pressure is, so it kind of squirts it out, but some of it stays too. And we'll talk more about that too. Okay, so water can come out and nitrogenous waste can come out. Nitrogenous wastes are going to include primarily these three things, creatinine, 
And creatinine is evidently so bad for our body to have in high amounts that 100% of it that gets filtered will end up coming out in the urine. There will not be any of it that is reabsorbed in a healthy kidney. And it is a byproduct of making ATP in a hurry. So if you imagine like a football player and they're coming off the line or they're starting up at a sprint, then that power they need for the first 10 seconds, the waste product from producing that quick ATP power is called creatinine. And then it goes out of the muscle cells and to the kidneys and then it's filtered and it comes out in our urine. Another nitrogenous waste, just meaning it has a nitrogen in it, is urea. And this is actually how urine gets its name because there's so much urea in it. And a slightly more, I mean, I guess I would just call it a slightly more uh, concentrated version called uric acid. And these are, can actually crystallize out in, uh, if they're too high in the body and that can cause gout, like in the big toe, for example. Okay, what else can get filtered? Well, electrolytes can. I'll name a few just to get your jog your memory about electrolytes. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. All of these are electrolytes, electrolytes that are freely filtered. And depending on how much salt we need in our body, maybe how much we need to raise our blood pressure, most of this sodium can either leave or some of it can be reabsorbed. Actually, lots of it will be reabsorbed into the body. We're not as good at reabsorbing potassium. In fact, we reabsorb very little of it, but we can um, get rid of extra, which is called secretion, and we'll talk about that later too. And though that's important when we talk about what kind of diuretic is prescribed. You might have heard of what's called a potassium sparing diuretic, and we will talk about that too later. Okay, so these are all electrolytes. I hope it doesn't seem like I'm going too slow in this video, but there is a lot to cover on this, and it really, um, I think, is worth the time to take a long time to go through um, how the nephron works so that you can really appreciate it. Glucose, of course, can be filtered, but in a healthy person, the glucose shouldn't end up in the urine. Same with amino acids. And then um, acids and bases. This is called bicarbonate. And then something that makes the urine yellow. If you've ever wondered why, it's because of a broken down uh, product from that's left over from the pigment in red blood cells. And it is called urochrome. It's a, basically a form of bilirubin or the color for it, I guess. And this is what gives urine it's yellow color. Okay. It's, oops. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put Billy Rubin here because I know you've all heard of that. But it's, and Billy Rubin is yellow. I think Eurochrome is the specific name for the pigment that's in it. Okay. So, um, not everything should get to come out of the blood and go into Bowman's capsule though. So let's also have a list of things that can be filtered. So things that were filtered and then things that can't be filtered. So to do that, let's put um, filter with the big cross through it. So no filtering allowed for these things. These are things that if they're in the blood, and they're passing into this glomerular capillary bed, even if the pressure is high in there, these things can't get out into the water tube. Things like red blood cells and white blood cells. Do you know why they can't get filtered? It's really just because they're too big. And it's the same with big plasma proteins like fibrinogen. These things are all just too big. Same with hormones, or a lot of hormones, I should say, like insulin. So those things that are too big can't fit through the little gaps in the red blood cell, or in the 
capillary um, cell wall and can't get into Bowman's capsule. Okay, so now um, I also want to take a moment to define some blood vessels for you. So we'll just keep using our black pen. This blood vessel right here is called the afferent arterial. An arterial is a, just a very tiny blood vessel, and um, whenever you see afferent, it means going towards something. So like in the nervous system, we learned about afferent neurons are sensory neurons. They're going to the brain. Well, in this case, the blood vessel is going to Bowman's capsule. And then in Bowman's capsule, it becomes a very tiny capillary bed called the glomerulus. Usually I write glomerular capillary bed, but I'm a little tight on space right here. And that's where, that's where the filtering actually occurs. And then this exiting blood vessel is called the efferent arterial. It's really important for healthy kidneys to always filter 125 mils per minute. So if there's not enough filtering happening, then the afferent arterial can dilate and let more blood come into Bowman's capsule and more fluid can be filtered. If too much is being filtered, then the afferent arterial can actually constrict down and protect the delicate glomerulus from the high blood pressure. All right, so I'm trying to move along so that I don't lose you to la la land. Let's go to the next part and that's the proximal convoluted tubule. I'm going to make it orange. Okay, we'll write about it up here. Proximal, I'm using orange, convoluted tubule or the PCT. Okay, so what happens in the PCT? Well, first of all, we have to try and figure out its name too. The word proximal means that there's probably a distal, right? Sure enough, yeah, there is a distal convoluted tubule. So what does the proximal mean and what does the distal mean? Well, the proximal means that this convoluted tubule is closest to Bowman's capsule. The distal convoluted tubule, you'll see, is a couple sections later, so it's farther from the from Bowman's capsule. Convoluted means twisty and tubule because it is clearly a tube. So what happens in the proximal convoluted tubule? Well, as it turns out, tons happens here. About 80% of what was filtered here will actually be reabsorbed. So all, almost all of the water, almost all of the salts. When we say reabsorbed, we mean it goes from the tubule to the paratubular capillaries. I'll just put caps. So about 100 mil, milliliters that got filtered here is reabsorbed by the end of the proximal convoluted tubule. And, or if you want to look at how much for a day, about 160 liters a day. But you could tell this is not going to be enough to keep you from becoming dehydrated. Like if your um, nephron just ended right here, you would still have 40 liters of urine in a day. And that is impossible, right? Um, some rare disease states that can happen, like diabetes insipidus, but m more likely what we're looking at here is um, there must be a lot more reabsorption of water that happens later on, especially in uh, the collecting duct. So we'll talk about that um, as, we, as we move along the tubule. So about 40, so I'm going to put this symbol here, it means therefore about 40 liters a day passes this part.
everything else already got reabsorbed. So what does get reabsorbed? What, what do we really care about here? Well, all of the glucose will get reabsorbed. But you do have a transport maximum, like how many molecules of glucose can be returned to the blood as they pass through. And if there's so much blood sugar, then it surpasses the transport maximum, then you can lose glucose in the urine. And so that's why diabetics can end up with glucose in their urine. Okay, it's time for me to draw on here some paratubular capillaries. So remember we have to get to the afferent arterial to deliver blood to Bowman's capsule, and this will constrict or dilate to control how much is gonna get filtered. And then whatever um, isn't filtered here continues out of the efferent arterial. And then the efferent arterial actually branches to become another capillary bed called the paratubular capillary bed. And I'm just going to draw it cartoon style like this so that you get the idea that it is surrounding all of the parts of the tubule. And that's how it's able to reabsorb back into the blood. Oops, I just messed up on my 3D. <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. Okay, and then we will continue with the paratubular capillaries. So something that got filtered right here, interestingly enough, so it's coming in the blood, let's say um, um, an atom of sodium or sodium electrolytes. It's coming in here, it's coming in here, pressure's high in here, so it pushes out of the blood vessel into the tube. It's going along here, going along here, and then boop, just goes straight back to the blood again that it just came from. That's what reabsorption is. Okay, so what else gets reabsorbed? Well, all of the amino acids in a healthy person should be. If someone has protein showing up in their urine, that's a sign that the glomerular capillaries are damaged and large molecules like proteins that normally shouldn't be able to come out could come out and then go through the tube. Then um, adjusted, I'm going to put this for acidity, adjusted levels of hydrogen and bicarbonate. And the purpose of that is if the blood is too um, acidic right here, then it can secrete hydrogen into the proximal convoluted tubule. And if the um, blood is too basic here, it can actually reabsorb hydrogen ions back into the blood. So they're reabsorbed and secreted as needed. And also any creatinine that might not have been filtered here can be secreted from the paratubular capillaries into the tubule because remember I said that our body gets rid of all of the creatinine as it passes through the kidneys. Okay, so we're obviously going to need a part two with this, and I'll pick up with the loop of Henley in that.